Okay, welcome back. Jesse and I have been continuing our conversation about what is happening in the United States with the George Floyd murder. Yesterday was his funeral and the protests are now on almost a week of continuous protesting. Things in the United States have been very escalated. Tensions have been run very, very high. The resident in the Oval Office has ended up sending tear gas to clear out the way so he could walk from the White House to the church to hold up a Bible to make a statement. And there's been just so much components around this attention that has come because we have not had a real in-depth conversation that has taken place in race. Jesse, we share legacy. Let's talk about uh, your grandmother, my, my mother. What do you remember or what do you know of her legacy of starting the summer time in the United States? Well, I remember her more as Ducky than Granny, but that's just when, you, when you're small. Um, so, Granny was always an activist. She always believed in education. She always believed in treating people equally and equitably. And something that she got, got into my head very early on was you treat everybody with respect. Whether it's a color, position, whatever it is, you just treat everybody correctly and yeah that's I think that's a lesson she was trying to pass on to everyone and I mean you know a lot more about the actual marches and things so she was in, part of so she, so she went to the United States in 1946 to do her masters this was a period when very very few women went to university very few women of color attended or graduated from high school let alone university so in 1946 she went to the United States and spent two years and in that period, she traveled from Syracuse, New York to New York City to meet with Paul Robeson, an activist who had, was a part of bringing her to the United States. And she marched in some of the civil rights movement in 1946, 1947, 1948 era. This conversation that we are having did not just start the other day. The conversation of race and the challenges of people being disenfranchised goes back all of this time. Martin Luther King became very, very vocal on the need for civil disobedience, the need to be able to get up there and speak out about injustice. So Jesse, sort of, again, you grew up uh, in the post-apartheid South Africa. I grew up with the civil rights movement in South Africa. I grew up with the protests. I know it's like to be pepper sprayed, or tear gas rather, by the police because I was caught as a teenager in 1980 in the uprising, well, actually I wasn't even a teenager, I was 12 years of age attending high school when we had the huge sit-ins across the country objecting to apartheid. So not in the United, just in the United States, but even in South Africa, we've had these fights around justice and equality for all. Did you have to face anything like this? You know, I, I was, I'm, I'm lucky enough that I haven't had to face anything that intense apart from, oh, that's a B, uh, <laughs> the level of intensity right now, your moment of your three. Yeah, jeez, a B. It's terrifying. Um, no, I've never had to face any major racial stereotypes or prejudice. My generation, or at least my South African generation, apart from the, um, we had a march for stopping violence against women last year, and we all wore black, and we really, we made a conscious effort as young South African men to come together and and just you know one bad apple makes everybody look really bad no, and it, it ruins the rest of us and then we we go out and we try to be better humans and it's it's the only thing we can do I mean just some of the racial violence and the domestic violence and just violence in general here yeah, it's terrifying so yeah maybe I haven't been actively involved in protesting every every issue but that was something I felt strongly about because I respect women and again, the George Floyd incident and the millions of others before him, this is something I feel strongly about. I mean, in our previous video, I heard about your experience with it. And it's, it's just, it's not right. You can't, you should not be treating people this way. And there needs to be a way where we can go out and change this. Because we, I don't want, you know, I don't know if I'm having kids or not yet, but I don't want another generation to be having to protest. Because this is... Grand, this is Granny, your mom. This is you. This is me. Uh, there we were people three, before we Granny. Uh, I really hope that we don't need to have another generation 
making these videos and trying to fight back. So before we talk about the follow-on aspect, but when you ended up going and posting, did you feel unsafe? Did you feel threatened by police? No, it was a peaceful protest. It, we had signs and we marched and it was peaceful. There was no looting. Uh, a lot of the time, yes, there can be looting, but in this particular incident, we weren't looting. It was just everybody coming together to show support for the females in our country. So. And so when we are facing the aspect of, of protesting, this is non-violent resistance. This is passive resistance. This is not picking up a gun and shooting somebody. This is not picking up a brick and throwing. This is about speaking up and having a voice heard. When protests turn violent, the voice is drowned out. And in the case of the United States, where we've been having mass protests taking place in the last couple of weeks, a very small element of those protests have turned violent. And the violence has resulted when people have infiltrated to circumvent the messaging. The protests were not about being militant. There's a difference of going out to protest, to smash things, to burn things. This is not a war zone. It is going out and peacefully protesting. Now, unfortunately, the hijacking of where people have picked up bricks, a few rotten apples have picked up bricks and smashed windows and then set things on fire and started attacking the police. And also the response of the police has had a critical impact on whether a protest is violent or non-violent. Let's look at, for example, uh, Chris Swanson and the, a couple of the police chiefs. Yeah, that, that, was, that was just great. Uh, I mean, this massive, massive police officer, and he takes off his riot gear and he says to the crowd, I hear you, I'm with you, and they chant walk with me, and he walks with them. He, that's right. he does so, a peaceful protest with them. The police and the people were coming together to discuss this problem and it was yeah. nobody no there were no windows broken yeah. no damages and this is where people just want to be heard and two of the police chiefs that you'll see in some of the follow-on uh, supporting videos that are built around this you'll see chris hogan and some other uh, uh, entities that support some of our conversation but again it is a very big difference of are you heard when you are heard are you respected and any form of disagreement is about establishing the lines of communication. You can't have lines of communication if there is no mutual respect and no agreement to try and find a common ground. We're going to disagree, but we have to find the common ground to be able to move forward, to be able to come to the, to the healing. Again, in South Africa, we had a Truth and Reconciliation Committee, but then a strong opinion about that. Yeah, Granny, Granny believed that the TRC was correct to have happened. Just the way it was executed was not done to... It didn't, it didn't do the justice it deserved, so it still left a lot of people angry. And that anger's carried on for the 25 years now. And, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't think... Has the United States had an actual no, sit-down where they say, okay, from this first guy that was murdered or abused or discriminated against have we spoken about it from the beginning to the end and drawn the line in the sand and say okay now we are going to move forward and here's the no new these stuff. are these are the types of conversations that we are going to have to have but i want to to, to be able to bring that conversation forward we have to start to look at the political structure of the united states or of other countries and we need a combination of yes when we see something that is wrong we speak up we protest it in in a various form and just the fact that we're speaking up this between jesse and i could be seen in a way as our own personal protest against injustice you don't have to just go out into the streets but it's not about just posting something on social media it's not just about oh this upsets me and now you move on it is, has there has to be followed through so Let's talk a little bit about some of the, the process of that, of that follow through. Now, in, in South Carolina, we've had some really difficult challenges. One of our homes is in Charleston. And I got an email from Scott Wilson, the chief prosecutor for, Char for Charleston uh, region, Charleston County region. And the headline was, Neil, we need you. And I did not know Scott Wilson, but she ended up emailing us because she was dealing with the Jerry Roof case of where the white supremacists had gone, the Dylan Roof case where the white supremacists had gone into the church and killed nine people. And right also in that same period, she was dealing with the Michael Slager 
case of where a police officer shot a black man in the back and then planted the gun. Now, as the prosecutor, she has to choose to take the case. She has to look at the evidence of what is there and gather the facts and say, do we have a case? In the case again of, of George Floyd, the prosecutor had to look at the evidence and say, here is a murder that has taken place, or here is a death that has taken place. Is it murder? What degree of murder? Facts have to be gathered. And we can't rely on one person's word against the other person's word in a vacuum. Again, part of these conversations happened because there was video. The cops have body cameras, uh, there were bystanders who've taken out the camera and they filmed things, forcing conversation. And it is about how quickly can a prosecutor actually move forward. That is a critical uh, entity. Yes, Scarlett had to gather her facts and it just it did take a few days for her to, to prepare her case to advise this is what we're going to do and make the necessary arrests. We have to allow the process, but we cannot allow the process to become hijacked. We cannot allow the process to be ignored. We can't allow people to get away with things that they should not get away with because we will continuously be at this crossroad. Yeah, it, you sh there shouldn't just be the process taking place because we're out in the streets and we're out on the internet and we're, we're saying something about it. This should be done regardless of if it's somebody who nobody knows who's just completely isolated and something horrible like this happens, we should be talking about it. But we and, need to be doing, you know, due we, process should be done. But we need to do more than talk about it. There is another really critical aspect. What do you believe that other critical aspect that we have to, that follows when we see injustice, that follows to rectify injustice? I mean, it's, it's one thing to, to march to City Hall or march up the road. It's, it's another thing to march to get certain things passed and march to the actual polls or the voting booths and and there know, is it do th just take the time you know we spend so much time doing complete other things but it's it's not it doesn't i mean how long does it realistically take to to register to vote is it a day is it like a month what <laughs> no, it's what's the story because it seems are, like america's uh, always got some yeah. kind of election well, coming always elections so. coming and we have a major election this coming november yeah. and we have, we have to get people to register to vote. That's the first thing, is if you are eligible to vote, you have to register to vote. That is just a matter of filling out a form with your address where you reside. And that is going to also determine which precinct you can vote in. Then you could do, in some states you can do a, uh, a mail-in vote. Obviously people like to show up, but there's also the ability to do early voting. But again, if you don't vote, you really can't complain because you're not a part of the conversation. You're not there. It's like, as somebody said, you get invited to a restaurant to dinner and you show up late and then you complain that what is on the table being served is you don't like what's there, but you were not there when the menu was issued and you had a choice in what you could eat. So you didn't, again, you didn't have the conversation about what restaurant to go or, to. Or even what restaurant to go to. So you've got to start becoming active in understanding what's happening in your community what is on the ballot who's going to be on the back and if you don't like what's on the ballot who's on the ballot be a part of the process to get the things that matter or the vaccine to some of the things that are wrong that may be coming onto the ballot there's a countermeasure there's a yes and there's a no it's not always as clear cut but it is again about the voting is where we continue the conversation and we have a real challenge young people you don't vote. Yeah. Again, the, let's go back to the Obama years. Yeah. Well, like, uh, I didn't. Uh, I voted for in the South African elections. I didn't vote in the American elections no, just because I'm not vote. eligible but, to vote in the yes, American elections. But your generation. But my generation, States. we have a serious problem. We can spend days and days being activists over the phone and making pages. But we can't spend, I don't know, half a day sitting at, you said it's the DMV. So, yes, so just one of the places. And then another half, a, I mean, how long are the lines? I mean, I mean, do you remember the, um, the, our, our uh, democracy, uh, our first democratic election? People stood in lines in South Africa for, for days. Which, that's right. For, uh, very yeah, long time. No, we don't have that in the States. We don't yeah. have uh, ultra, ultra long. Yes, in certain precincts, you may end up having a two or three hour. Two or three hours. Uh, wait to get. But those are unusual circumstances. That's not the norm. You know, Don we should make this video two to three hours long and you can watch it while you're standing in line or something. Because two or three hours is not... 
That's not a long period of time. But the longest I stood in line, because I like to show up at the polls, the longest I stood in line was probably 45 minutes. From the time I've walked into the door, showed my voter registration card, and by the way, a voter registration card you only do when you change address. I've been at the same address for 20 years. That has been my precinct for 20 years to vote in. So I've only had to register one time. So you, you one registered time. once and you can vote when it... And I can vote in every yes. election. Yes. And, and, and the elections I held, I happen to live about two, two kilometers, uh, one mile from the poll. I literally could walk to it. And stand in line, go to the desk, they, they take your card. In our case, we also have to provide ID. I'm not a fond of having to provide ID if you have a voter registration card because it's part of suppression of voting, but that's a different conversation. But once you have your registration card, they also have a checkbox that sort of says, yes, this is a registered voter, and this person is here right now. They are now in the line to go to the booth. Mr. Peterson is going to vote. Exactly. Now you step into the next part of the line, the continuation of the line, to get to the booth. And we have electronic voting, and so I look at a touch screen, boom, 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 boom. I have certain things that I can hit, there are all the different things. If it's a presidential race, who are the presidential candidates? And then with that, we always have a certain number of senators, which is six year terms. So every two years there's a race. So that means in three cycles, there is a senatorial component to the federal race and a senatorial component to the state race. Because we vote for federal government, we vote for state government, and we vote for local government, all on the same ballot. So it's, it's one one vote. It's one series. So of this this November yeah. election, it's one. So you have to stand have in one that's, line. That's right. So you have to go to one place, and it's one touch screen that you fill out. The presidential out. side will be this. Uh, our our senator, I believe, is going to be up on on vote. We are every two years is a member of Congress, because that cycles every two years. Every four years is a governor. We we had that two years ago or a year ago, and then we have. The House of Representatives, which is the the house, the local state house, where again, uh, the Congress to the local house, the con the senator to the local house. Then, again, we have uh, the the mayor and the city council. Those are also a part of the ballots in most cases. So every November, if the if if the mayor and the city councillors are not up on the four year cycle or the two year cycle, it will be an alternative year. But every November is some form of a voting period. That also should be a national holiday in the United States so people don't have to take a day off from work. But yeah, the process is not complicated. The process is not time consuming. And people say, oh, well, my vote doesn't matter. Well, I'm gonna tell you, every vote counts. We had a race in South Carolina that was predominantly, that in Charleston, that predominantly leaned a certain way. And the opposition party never had a position uh, of, of, of victory. And there was a, a primary. And actually, this was uh, the, the former governor of South Carolina, Mark Sanford, who I happen to know and worked with. Mark was a Republican. And he was primaried by Trump within the Republican Party. He lost the primary to uh, somebody who ended up challenging him, who was a very much of a Trump supporter. Mark, even though he was in the same party, had some criticisms of Trump. So Trump had in primary. So this person won, this woman ended up uh, winning the Republican primary and it was pretty much a shoe in that she was going to be the next representative. And the Democrats really didn't have a strong uh, uh, position in this area because it has been a very much of a Republican leaning district. But somebody put their hand in, uh, the, uh, in, in the ring, their hat in the ring, uh, Joe, uh, uh, um, oh, I've forgotten Joe's last name. Uh, Joe, Joe Cunningham put his hat in the ring and he didn't look like he had a chance. But again, the Democratic uh, community got behind and said, we will turn out, we are going to show up. And it looked impossible, but people showed up. We showed up. I flew back to South, South Carolina from the Caribbean to cast my ballot because I looked at the policies of the Republican woman. She did not represent my interests. Joe Cunningham represented more of my interests. I don't agree with everything, but those are the two choices. I cast that vote not believing that he's going to win and that we will have a Trump person in my, uh, my House uh, representative. Well, enough people showed up, and guess what? By almost 700 votes, 
700. No, 700 ish. Joe Cunningham won. He became. Yeah. But if I didn't show up, if my neighbors didn't show up, if people stayed away from the polls, we would have had a different outcome to what has happened in Charleston. So you've got to show up and vote. And again, the face of this next election can be completely changed if the young people, if you show up in your jurisdictions as young people and vote, and if you don't like what the mayor is doing in terms of the appointment of the chief of police and the policies, no, don't vote for him. Find another candidate. Vote for the guy who's not going to put, you know, these people in charge. Stop. And also, sort of as a prosecutor, that position is an elected official. So if you don't feel that justice being, is being served, you get a chance to actually vote for the person who is serving the justice. So again, we can complain and we can speak up, but our actions are what's going to matter. Yeah. So let's let's keep let's keep peaceful. Let's keep our peaceful protests up. Let's keep having this discussion. Let's keep sharing the information, but let's not lose the energy. You know, come November for the Americans. One way get or out, another, get out and vote. It's. Yeah. It doesn't sound like it's too difficult. No, it is not difficult, and also this is your responsibility. As President Obama keeps reminding us, when the young people turn out, you have the longest time to live the consequences. Yeah. He made a comment that. You don't, as young people, you don't want Granny to choose your music. No. So you don't give her your, your music device, but yet you are handing over uh, your future. You're going to be living in, again, in the political situations of Africa. You are 22, 23 years of age. You've got yeah. 60 or 70, 80 years to deal with the consequences. Yeah, of which what's is happening. why I turned out and I voted. You know, it's, it's my choice. I mean, luckily with Granny, she actually had some really good music taste. But a lot of the time, the older generation might not have the best taste, and they might vote for, you know, not the greatest people. And or they are voting based on a fear, or they don't understand yeah. all the issues. They are voting because they don't like, or it's a gender thing, or it's a race thing. But you should be voting for the people who are going to protect your interests and your community's interests. I think that's. But also vote for the people who share your values. Yeah. Your values are really, really important. If you're going to know what is right from what is wrong, what is fair from what is unjust, these are the important core issues of who we are as a society. And when we vote, we are, again, endorsing what we want to see as our values going forward. We are here now, 25 years post-apartheid. We still have a lot of challenges to overcome in South Africa, as the United States has many challenges to overcome. Yeah. But it's going to be overcome by being a part of the process, being a part of the solution. Not complaining about the problems, but actually working to solve these issues. So it doesn't matter where in the world we are, doesn't matter who we are, where your jurisdiction lies, vote.